Happy Easter. Happy Easter, everybody. Good morning, I see three people already. Welcome, Margaret, James. Who else is there? Somebody else is there in hiding. Four people, that's excellent. Good morning, happy Easter to everybody. As soon as we went live, I said good morning, but there was nobody there, so I wish to say it again. Here's our waning moon over Mount Arbel there to the left of center. More in the center now of a high. We have this celebration color this morning of sunrise. We had beautiful Easter vigil here in Duke and last evening. Last night, we had some surprise participants who came from locally as well, some Christians. Those moments make it special. Here in Galilee, Jesus said to, or the angel said to the, to the, uh, women go and tell the disciples to go to Galilee. I go there before them. There I will see you. There you will see me. So my first little question this morning is where are you in this? Where are you right now spiritually? Where are you emotionally? Because I've always noticed a little challenge for people, for myself, that I really got into the contemplation of the passion of Christ because it's so emotional, so, so difficult, so horrendous, so unfair, so unjust. So there's a lot of compassion and you get into it. And then the resurrection is in a way more difficult to get into because it's not bloody gory. Uh, it's a little intangible. So I've got little thoughts about that. And then <clears throat> what it means to be risen, what it means, what, what the resurrection means, what, what it, just not, just just meaning, what's its impact in my life? What are the consequences? What are the, the uh, what's the transforming power in my life of the resurrection? And I must say that I personally had wake up there on Holy Thursday, Good Friday, especially about the resurrection, pondering this truth of our faith. So let's just go through the steps, how people uh, got to the connection with the resurrection. And the first thing, all of them, they didn't see Jesus from the dead. Nobody did first. The first thing they was heard. They were told he is risen. That's the first thing. They were told he is risen. It's an announcement. And Paul would later go on to say for also for that and other reasons, faith comes through the ear. I saw one catfish now. There were a lot yesterday, very few today. Oh yes, I see a couple more. There's a little guy down there.
I've never seen this stream so strong before. <clears throat> and that's my prayer that our stream of faith, of living faith, will be strong and renew us, refresh us, bring new life into our spiritual lives. So the first thing is to be told, to hear. The phone is a little bit slanted, isn't it? I don't know how to fix that, I better leave it alone. The first thing is to hear. Now what's the next thing that happens? Well, you could hear stuff and not react to it. And we hear today, we see that when Mary Magdalene, well, first of all, she hears as well, and she hasn't seen Jesus yet. And because she hears, she goes to share with the disciples. Mary Magdalene, you know, we're here in Magla, people. This is her mountain here, Mount Arbel, her lake, her town. These trees probably weren't here then, but other ones. Busy port, fishermen, work, trade people of all ages, little babies, to grandparents, great-grandparents, Roman soldiers, because that was the time, down to Herod Antipas, in his headquarters here in Tiberias, Emperor Tiberius time. You know, it's historical. Real people, real time, real places. That's our faith. Faith in the sense that's where the historical context and the geographical context in which our faith is located. That's not faith, that's, that's knowledge. But the faith itself, the faith in Jesus risen from the dead, then that is faith. So they ran <clears throat> to the disciples and told them the tomb is empty. So, okay, so now John and Peter hear this and the other disciples. But it's John and Peter run, the other guys don't. At least it's not reported that they do. It's only reported that John and Peter ran. And that's very interesting. They ran. They, they got into action. Their, their faith made them go. Maybe the others were too sad, too broken, too, felt too guilty. Peter was always a guy of action when, when there was a moment of information. He always acted when there was a a situation, a circumstance, Peter always did something. He acted. Some people might have it more difficult maybe just to shake themselves into action. The armchair is more comfortable. Their bed is more comfortable. Their routine and status quo is more comfortable. But Peter is an action guy. Also part of it could be natural disposition, but also if you're interested in something, you're going to go and look for it. Gosh, these Egyptian geese are growing very fast. They're really big. They all seem to have to share, to share the same issue with fleas or whatever it is that they're picking themselves. You know what the shortest poem in the world is? It's, it's called Fleas. And the poem itself is Adam Haddam. So now they go and still they haven't seen the risen Lord.
And now they run to the tomb. So they heard and they ran. They ran. There's something about running. We're just every morning doing a sunrise stroll and chat. We're not in a hurry. We're taking it easy. There's something about running. And the very little detail that John ran faster, that's also very interesting. Younger, there's a bit of compet competition between us all. Wants to get there first to do the breaking news bit, to be the first to post the information, that little edge we have, to be ahead of the game. But then amazingly he stops and he lets Peter in first. And you know what, there's some little clue in that. I've always thought about this, some little clue about disposition for faith because if faith comes through the ear that's very connected to trust and to accepting knowledge from others that's something about somebody who is receptive who is not totally autonomous who is disconnected from the others who is totally independent, who doesn't want to listen. And in this regard, he also cedes the first place to Peter and that has to be connected with the very mission of Peter and the role of Peter. And as smart as John is, and as go-getter as he is, and as connected as he is to the high priest, and he gets Peter in inside on Holy Thursday evening at Caiaphas' house, he has all these connections, he lets Peter in first. To let Peter in first. Because Jesus gave Peter a special role. And that ability is very conducive to the, the heart being aligned for the gift of faith, for the gift of revelation. Because revelation doesn't come to the proud. Lord, you have hidden this from the proud and the arrogant, and you have revealed it to the little ones. That's a prayer Jesus spoke. Heavenly Father, I thank you because you have revealed this to the little ones. I'm going to go around and not go through here because there's cobwebs and everything and it's easier to do a little detour than to get out all the cobwebs off the sweater. So, eventually they still don't see Jesus, but now they're processing the story, the information. They're processing the data. And there's some very details about the shroud and the headcloth lying there. And at this point, I want to mention two little comments. Bishop Barn gave a nice commentary yesterday for today's readings. It's posted on Word on Fire and Bishop Barn YouTube. But I also heard a talk yesterday for an hour and a half, and I put in the link for you here. It's absolutely incredible, and it's demanding intellectually to follow it. Um, so I encourage you to get your, if, that, if you watch, if you need a cup of coffee or whatever it is, find a comfy spot, give yourself time. It's incredible talk of this guy, Robert Spitzer. In fact, I've met him and he's completely blind now. So sad. And he was many years president of Gonzaga University. I think that's in Washington state, out that direction, in the Western United States. And he gives an incredible talk and I've actually learned new things about the shroud and I knew a lot about the shroud but I haven't been following it the last few years in terms of latest scientific conclusions. And it's absolutely brilliant. But before that, he goes into a lot of reasons for the resurrection. And there again, he's a very brilliant man. It's, very, it's a very smart lady interviewing him. 
the youtube channel is called lila rose but you have the link here i posted it on the in the text that you'll have with this video and i really recommend you to listen to that invite a couple of friends it's uh it's challenging language it's very scientific and he gives us the latest physical science in terms of nuclear radiation for the production of the shrouded theory i hadn't heard in this way which makes an awful lot of sense and is absolutely very interesting so i encourage you to to check that out so we can process a lot of information and none of that's going to prove to us that jesus rose from the dead what it does is it can prepare our minds to be humble before a revelation that's so incredibly transformative for us and for the world. Somebody told us the name of these white ones before. This is one here closer to me. I don't want to walk in all the grass. I have my nice black trousers on. Maybe go close to some more of them here, but you probably know. Uh, something about lace, right? Something lace, some grandma's lace, or I forget what lace it was. It's nice to see it all in flower here. The first reading is Peter's bold proclamation of the person of Christ, the mystery of Christ on uh, Pentecost. Because before that, they're too afraid to talk too much. They need the Holy Spirit to give them that power, that strength, that dynamo. Which is also another interesting factor in the growth in the faith. The, the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Because also he's the one through whom we can say Jesus is Lord. That's also another very fascinating conclusion of Paul. So I think I've used up all my time and I wanted to cover a lot more stuff, but the Easter season will allow us to do it. And I'm just fascinated. Maybe I'll do something a bit different at the Mass now at 8.15. But it's really fascinating, this whole story of the resurrection. Completely, completely uh, uh, way outside what people expected, what the disciples expected, what the authorities expected what the opposition to Jesus expected, his opponents. It's totally out of their loop, out of their control, out of their expectations. It's a revolution, people. And if Jesus rose from the dead, it's a whole different story now about understanding how definitive is suffering and hatred and sin and death Jesus risen from the dead changes all of that. So can I still continue pursuing my vanities? Can I still pursue as the only reality worldly successes, worldly pleasures, worldly power and dominion? Or am I investing in the wrong, am I betting on the wrong horse, investing on the wrong company? It's like AI is coming and you need to switch and adjust. <laughs> With Jesus, it's not just AI, it's like, gazillion intensity totally different and it relativizes everything in this cosmos everything it relativizes completely and that's the huge consequence and that's what it did for those guys these regular joe mike johnny fishermen here at the sea of galilee i hope this easter season will also be a big blessing for you and will also be relativize your situation, your suffering, your expectations from life, uh, your relationships maybe that are burdened with other people, and that you'll really have in your heart a new alleluia. Praise the Lord. He has brought us out of the pit. He has rescued us. If you're suffering bereavement of close relatives recently, this resurrection faith is essential it's our life people god bless you he is risen hallelujah greetings from galilee come to galilee there you will see him